picking out magnetics. Uh, so I'd like to use this as an opportunity if people have questions or there's discussions, we can do that. I would also just like to kind of go through a little bit more slowly a few of the things that have to do with applications. Because the applications uh, will basically fall into three main areas for you. And just to kind of be aware of what's going on is, uh, is good. We had kind of gone over uh, a little bit this last lecture. I was thinking I would be able to get through everything, but there wasn't enough time. So I'm going to repeat just a couple of, uh, of, of slides. But here's basically the, uh, the idea. We've got magnetic data. It's got some information in it. And depending upon what scale you're looking at, what kind of problems you're interested in, you might work with these data in different ways. The most simple is just to look at the data themselves and say, OK, what, what can I see from that? And the main thing here were the uh, basically images of, uh, the, of the geology. So we're going to look at those. And then there was some aspects about uh, basically trying to understand the magnetic signature within the context of very simple bodies. That's where our dipole comes in. That's where the monopole comes in. That's where like a sheet of monopoles could come in. Uh, that's sort of in that domain here. And the third gets down to greater complexity. We're actually saying, oh, the Earth is really complicated. We've got a 3D volume out there. We're going to try to... Uh, see if we can uh, interpret what's there. So a couple of these slides that uh, we talked about previously. So here's just looking at the geologic map and the magnetic map, and we've shown this. And you can see that just by looking at the image, uh, you can make a correspondence, especially if you know something about what's happening here, then, OK, that tells you that that makes that correspondence, and now you can see that the same magnetism kind of coming up here. Maybe that's delineating this whole region. So that's perhaps, as I said, one of the biggest uses of magnetics is basically in, uh, in, in geologic mapping. And looking at faults, for instance, if you have a fault, then very often you've got uh, an alteration that's going along the fault. And faults themselves can just appear in the magnetic map. So you get a structure that's coming in like that, and then suddenly, you know, it's there's a, a, a truncation in here. So the image tells you that looks like there's something happening here. And in this case, that something is uh, just a, a, a fault. And then larger ore bodies uh, can also get delayed. The one thing that you'll see with magnetic data is that they'll often do post-processing on it. And the kinds of things that uh, you will see, for instance, here's a total field magnetic anomaly map. And superimposed on here are the uh, geologic structures. So you can see correspondences that are going on. But sometimes you can get a different image that uh, and connects with you geologically just by doing various processings on it. So a first derivative, we talked very briefly about that. Derivatives are just a change of something. So you could look at the change in an x direction, or you could look at a change in a, in a, in a vertical direction. And those will give you different kinds of images, and they might be <laughs> useful to you uh, in helping understand what you've got. So that's the first one. Just inference from images. The second is looking at uh, simple bodies with uniform magnetization. And that was really what gave rise to you know, the monopoles, the dipoles, and you know, dikes, and uh, various kinds of intrusive zones. I just want to talk a little bit about the uh, uh, unexploded ordnance in the munitions. Just that, I mean, we're not only working on it, but it's actually such a really important problem. We tend not to see so much of it in the context of North American work, although we do have munition sites in Canada, and there certainly are some in the United States. But we're working with people in uh, 
in Europe these days, Germany, uh, places that have been bombed very, very heavily, and you have uh, all kinds of uh, you know, residue problems that are that are <coughs> So I, I just thought this might be of interest to you, and I, I just wanted to kind of tell you a, a few things that, uh, that have happened. So if you look at, uh, at the number of sites that, that exist, there's actually sort of like 3,000 sites around the world, and maybe uh, tens of millions of acres, so it's really pretty big. And uh, the cost of these cleanups is, is really expensive. And you can appreciate why that is, because if you've got if you're looking for something that can explode, you have to be very careful. Unexploded ordinances are not as bad as landmines. Landmines are really sensitive to, you know, to touch or any pressure like that. But you know, an unexploded ordinance, you can likely walk over it, right? But you would not want to hit that with a plow or a shovel or anything like that. And uh, even in France, if you look at the statistics from France of the number of farmers who die every year because they're plowing up their fields and they hit some uh, ordinance item, you'll find it's about seven to 10 people a year. And that's and those are bombs from, you know, like the First World War. So we, we need to somehow kind of recognize the problem. And here's, here's just some of the sites, well, I guess this is most of the sites in the United States, but each of these dots represents actually a place where um, army uh, and Navy people have been trained uh, to use various kinds of artillery. And when you think that a lot of those artillery shells, you know, only between 90 and 95 percent of them actually explode, uh, that leaves a lot of things that are, that, are, that are left. And these are terrible images, but uh, this one was in California, it's Fort Ord. The only purpose of this is to just to give you some idea that uh, Does that help? Not much. Here's landscape, for instance. This is uh, a place we actually worked on here at Keho Alave. Uh, it's a sacred island in, uh, in Hawaii. Uh, it's now being turned back to native Hawaiians. In the process of doing that, it has to get cleaned up. And so the US uh, Army decides, OK, we can, we can clean this up. Uh, it's not, not a huge island, but they allotted something in the order of, I think it was like a hundred million dollars to go in and clean up, I don't know, maybe hundred hectares or, so, or, or something like this, right? So three years later, and another fifty million dollars spent, so that's like hundred and fifty million, they were actually twenty percent cleaned up. And the problem is that you know, these things are explosives, so every time you find something, you got to go in with all these DOD techs uh, and you know, be very careful cordon things off. And then you're scraping the dirt away with a little tiny shovel and trying to figure out what you've got. And then if you decide that it's uh, an ordinance item, then another group comes in, they, you know, they cordon off the area, and then they figure out what to do with it. Usually what they do is carry these very carefully over to some central region and then they just blow the whole thing up just at one time, or sometimes they'll just pull them up in place. Not everything you find is the ordinance item that you're looking for, horseshoe, piece of frag, whatever. And I showed you this before. This was in Limestone Hills in, in, in Montana. And I, I, I like this picture because it really sets the scene, right? You're, it's just like when you're down at the beach looking for those rods. The sand is the same everywhere. Same is true with the grass. Just you have no idea where to where to look. So you, I mean, you've got to do some kind of geophysics to kind of help you out. And you could do, as I said, sort of manual stuff, mag and flag. But honest to God, if you do mag and flag, you just look back and you got this sea of flags. So that doesn't help you. Well, I mean, it helps you, but it's kind of awesome. So you got you do some digital geophysics, and now we see this. And as I said before, you look at these pictures, and you you immediately say, "Oh, those are dipoles, right? 
you've got exactly that right characteristic. And there's a whole bunch of these things. And you also notice that, oh, they're flipped around. Oh, this guy's pointing this way. He's here. He's here. They're not in the same, they're not in one direction and they're not in the direction of your field. So they've got to be remnantly magnetized. You're just looking for iron objects. When you actually go out and do a survey, sometimes you just get great data. Like there's no question here about this guy. That's a little bit worse. Sometimes, you know, you start to get a lot of kind of speckled stuff in here. And then, you know, sometimes, and this is happens more often than not, there actually is a, uh, an ordinance item that's, that's buried in here, but you've got all kinds of other stuff. You can see that this might be a bit challenging on trying to figure out what's <laughs> there. The, there's two aspects here. One is to recognize the item, but even a piece of frag will look like this. So you actually want to do more. You want to do more than just recognize, oh, there's something there, because now you're digging up a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't really need to be dug up. And in these areas where there's a lot of munitions that are exploded, but you know, sometimes it's only one in 50 or one in 100 that's actually a live muni munition. The rest are all just junk items. So we'd like to be able to characterize a little bit better what these guys are. And magnetics actually helps us. Uh, electromagnetics is even better, and we might come to that at the end. But even from electromagnetics, uh, if we can find out something about you know, maybe the strength of this guy, as well as uh, you know, orientation, it might help us out a bit. So now you're in a problem that, that looks like this. We've got buried in the Earth an unexploded ordinance that really just looks like a bar magnet. And it has arbitrary <laughs> position, depth, horizontal location, and it has an arbitrary orientation and a strength. So those are the six parameters that, that you need. And for anybody who was uh, trying to fit the signature from out on the beach and you've got an app and you've got a number of different kind of parameters that you can play with uh, you, you can start to get the idea that yeah even a problem with maybe a half a dozen parameters is not hundred uh, percent trivial so we're going to need to do some sort of uh, more sophisticated analysis to to work with this and and this is what what we're going to do, and this is what is done in virtually all of the geophysical problems. We've got something here that we're trying to to uh, to find, to model, and we have to predict what the responses are going to be. So that's what the app did, right? You you buried a prism, put an inducing field in it, you you specified the susceptibility, and then you generated the data. So that's often called the forward problem. You're simulating the data. What we want to do is extract parameters. And that means we're going to do this inverse problem and try to somehow get, take these data and come back to a representation of this object. So that's an optimization problem. We're not going to go through any details about how to do that. But that's pretty standard uh, procedure for how to work with things and this is kind of what we get out so we start here with the data and now we've got all those parameters so we adjust them we program adjust them until we get like a best fit to the data and then we look at the difference between these two guys and you say oh yeah that's, that's not not too bad notice the scales here are much smaller than, than the scale up there so we've done not too bad a job and now we've got the parameters easting northern depth and moment azimuth and, 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 and depth so these things are actually useful from the point of view of, first of all, digging where it is. And later on, that becomes part of a discrimination analysis when we look with electromagnetics to help us decide whether that item is likely an ordinance item and needs to be dug up or whether it can just sit in the ground as a bunch of junk. So that's basically the, 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 the essence of the problem. We've got magnetics. We've got uh, a way of extracting parameters, and then we go ahead and do classification, and as I said, we'll later do the EN. There's uh, 
there's kind of an interesting story, which I hadn't really appreciated until I went out to dinner with a group of people that I work with and some, uh, some of the German colleagues. But there's, how many of you guys know what the Second World War was? <laughs> okay, so the Americans actually built uh, an atomic bomb uh, and let that thing go over uh, Japan twice, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, to devastating effects. But there was a real race on to generate an atomic bomb. The Germans had kind of started out first, and they had some ideas before they even did their initial invasions uh, in, into some of the European countries. Uh, and they progressed with that through, throughout the war, but it kind of got de-escalated as far as their priorities. They were having technical problems, uh, and it turned out the U.S. actually uh, beat them to it. Nevertheless, the Germans have continued to de develop this, and the, and the big thing with an atomic bomb is you've got to take this, you know, the uranium, and you've got to concentrate it. I mean, this is the big deal with Iran, right? This is why everybody's you know, concerned about the centrifuges and their ability to concentrate uranium. If you make it concentrated enough, then you can actually make it into a bomb. So there is an area outside of Berlin it was a town, and that was one of the central areas where they were trying to do this enrichment. About three weeks before the end of the war, the Germans were losing. The Russians are coming in to invade Germany. The U.S. realizes, like, oh my God, the Germans have got this huge concentration of technology, uranium, we do not want the Russians to get that first. <laughs> okay, so what does the U.S. do? So they take these big bombs, 500,000 pound bombs, and this is the part that I didn't know. You can actually have delayed fuses on these things. So you can drop a bomb, but it can be such that it actually doesn't detonate for a certain length of time after. The US bombarded this area, just a tremendous number of bombs, and they fused these things also that there was these big delays. Okay, so the, the, the Germans are exiting, the Russians are trying to come in, and now we've got this time span where these bombs are continually going off about every half hour, enough so that nobody actually wants to to, to go in, that gives the U.S. enough time to pulverize the rest of the stuff of what's going on and make whatever strategic trajectories there are. That's the background. The foreground is this area is not so far from Berlin. It's about 23 hectares, and it's got to be cleaned up. So what are we looking at? We're looking at bombs. They're about 500,000 pounds. And these guys are dropped in from willy-nilly. And here's kind of interesting. You know, a bomb drops at pointy end first, right? But we're going to see when we do the seismic that things can actually refract. So depending upon you know, what the materials properties, as something is coming in at a bit of an angle, it can actually could have bend around. So it, it turns out that, you know, some of the bombs are, you know, kind of in like sort of pointy and down, but other guys have just kind of got a trajectory. They went down in and they're kind of completely up. So they're, they're sort of sitting there pointy and up. And at the end of the day, you've got an area that's littered with these ordnance items. Each of these is magnetic. Each of these has got a remnant magnetization. And each of these is in some crazy direction. So some point down, some point up, this way, this way, okay? So what do you do? The basic problem is then trying to find these guys. You're trying to find a magnet. So now the thing is, okay, how big a field does 
a 500 pound bomb uh, make and how often would you have to sample the earth in order to, to find this? So it turns out, because these guys are so deep, that you can't just do a surface measurement. Remember the field falls off as one upon r cubed. So you put this guy in, you know, six, eight meters, you just can't see him from, from the surface. So that means you gotta drill. So now you say, okay, I'm going to put out a grid right here, and I'm going to drill. So then you have to figure out, okay, what's my sensitivity? If I put down a magnetometer in here, how far away can I detect this, this object? Turns out that for what they were doing, it's 2.3 meters. In other words, if, if you put a hole down, and you put a magnetometer down, and you could, you didn't see anything, that would tell you that it's, it's like, you know, you're likely free of any ordnance item for 2.3 meter radius. Okay, so that's the methodology. We just blanket the area with holes every 2.3 meters, and gradually sterilize it. How many holes do you think it takes? Anybody? Thousands. 47,000. 47,000 holes, each of them up to about 10, 12 meters deep. Each of them you put down a magnetometer. Each of them you try to see what you could see. And then they actually did find a number of them, so that meant a few, few more holes. Okay, but that's... Uh, I, I think that's that's an interesting story from a whole bunch of perspectives. Yeah, go ahead. Wouldn't they be worried about drilling into one of those? Yeah, that's the first one, right? <laughs> the first one's pretty iffy. So you drill down there, but then now you feel like, okay, I, I can safely scan out here, right? So you know, if I drill here, then okay, nothing. So I could go two meters here. Now I'm fine. I could do here, and you gradually set your way through. Like minesweeper, maybe you can go nine or so the, uh, yeah, so I think the, the, the point about that that's really interesting is that the simple geophysics that we've just done, okay, actually has a lot of relevance even in, in, in practice today. I mean, clearly we do things that are much more complicated, but you know, even understanding the basic principles, uh, you can sometimes go a long ways. Uh, I'd like to turn now attention to the next level, which is to actually think about uh, inverting uh, some data. So this is the uh, a diamond mine in uh, northern Canada. And all these pictures are courtesy of Dom, who was there, who did all of the processing of, of, of these guys. Um, so I'm not sure if you know that Canada is uh, very prominent in the diamond exploration and diamond production. I mean, anybody did? Who did not know that Canada was a prominent person or country in diamond? Okay, so there's a few. And then some of the Canadian diamonds have got a little polar bear etched on them just to tell you that they're, they're Canadian diamonds. The two diamond mines that you hear about are Ekati and, and Diavec. But there's a whole bunch of uh, places that are prospective. Diamonds, I uh, don't know whether you guys do that in geology, but they come up through what are called kimber-like pipes. So these are pipes that, you know, connected to, you know, the mantle. They might come up from, you know, a couple hundred kilometers depth. At those temperatures and pressures, um, diamond is actually a, a stable form of carbon. So if you were able to go down 150 kilometers, uh, you might have just like a, a lot of diamond there, right? So. The girl's best friend, 150 kilometers deep. Um, so we can take uh, we can take magnetic data over top here. So this is this is region. And you, you see these lines that are coming in here? Those are all dikes. So these are magnetic dikes that are are coming in through it, and that gives you some idea about the complexity of this uh, cratonic uh, shield area. 
And if we look a bit more closely at this, this was the observed data. Uh, notice how it's going to kind of from blue to you know, yellowish. So that's kind of like a regional trend. So it's big scale, right? Uh, this, you know, but you could take take a look at this and you can say, well, let me try to find a regional that kind of matches that background with something like this. Uh, but that's still like 400 nanoteslas, so it's, it's pretty big. Take this, subtract that, and you end up with this. And now this is this is more like the magnetic anomaly map that you would uh, really try to to infer. And you can see the dikes are coming out pretty pretty nicely. If you plot where the kimberlite pipes are with respect to the dikes, you see, oh, most of the kimberlite pipes are actually connected with where these dikes are, are, are coming in. So that's kind of favorable areas for prospecting. So even just kind of knowing where all the, the dikes are would, is, is a step forward. And there's there, all of these guys have different names. Uh, not sure how they, you know, Scorpion, Zach, Brent. Uh, this one we're going to look at is misery. So I, maybe it wasn't all that happy event for somebody, but it's kind of an interesting name. And the property is owned by BHP Billiton. And this is a surface map of, of what it looks like. And here's a kind of like a 3D volume rendering of the, of the pipes that uh, are, are diamondiferous and... Uh, Kind of looks looks something like that. Okay, this was all done by drilling, so lots of drill holes, and kind of gives you that kind of a picture. So now we come over, take the magnetic data. So here's the observed data. We're going to estimate a background. It's kind of like this. So you see, it's kind of large scale. So subtract this from the data, and now you've got anomalous data that you're going to interpret. So there's your data. Take those data, and this is Dom's inversion. Those data divide the Earth up into like a zillion little cells. Each one has got its own susceptibility. And recreate where the regions of high magnetic material is, and you got something that looks like that. So this is a great picture, right? Or you take a look at this, and you look at that, and you can say, okay, just, just from looking at those magnetic data and doing something with them, uh, you're actually able to get out something that you know, should have been really uh, informative to the geologists and to people looking at the market. So that's kind of the, that's kind of like that, that complicated end. So we have the three, part, three levels. Just look at the data, do something. Look at the data, analyze it, try to get a few parameters, do something. Look at the data, put it through a full you know, 3D inversion, get out a 3D you know, magnetic anomaly or magnetic susceptibility, and make your interpretation. So that's, uh, that, that's basically it. Uh, that's sort of the way in which we would uh, go about and try to extract uh, information from, from the magnetics. And that, that concludes this. So, okay, so questions about anything to do with magnetics or associated stuff? Guys, got it all? Good to go? Okay, what we will do on Friday. And I will ask you to uh, take a look at the GPG. We're working very hard at refactoring, and we're about 47 seconds ahead of you on this. Uh, but you can take a look at, uh, at the GPG, and especially uh, that part on the physical properties, because that's where we want to, want to get to. So what we're going to do now is completely switch gears. We're going to go to looking at elastic properties. So this means uh, shear modulus, uh, Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, these kinds of things. And we're going to do it through seismic velocity. So you had one, you know, in one component of that first lab, 
uh, where you're looking at physical properties, you did P wave and S wave velocity. We're going to look at, at that and uh, look at things like reflections and refractions and just to see how you can get a whole other suite of information uh, about what you're doing. Okay, thank you. You're good to go.